Hi. Uh, this is David Harrison. Is uh, uh, Dr. Ensley there? Hey, how are you? I uh, do very well. How are you doing? Well, I for a cold. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Well, any any hacking cough or or congestion, we you know is 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 fine by us. So and really, you know, and and I know we had to we had the chance to have some emails and su uh, such. I'm I really really glad uh, to have you presenting today. So uh, we actually have this being global grand rounds have folks call in not only from our U.S. offices here uh, headquartered in Boston, but also uh, in Canada and uh, Madrid as well. So um, without further ado, uh, I guess I'd, I'd love to introduce you and we can um, talk about um, uh, 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 cervical metastases from occult primaries. So um, Dr. Ensley is a professor uh, of oncology at the Barbara Ann Carmanos Cancer Institute. And um, he um, has worked both at Carmanos and at Wayne State University School of Medicine. Um, uh, most recently, he was the chief of the head and neck cancer section in the division of hematology and oncology at Carmanos. Um, he also served as professor of laryngology and head and neck surgery and medicine, um, uh, and in the Department of Internal Medicine. So, for for the non-physician folks, be able to span both surgical oncology and um, medical oncology fields and internal medicine is uh, no small task at all. Um, and uh, he also served as uh, an adjunct professor in radiation oncology, department radiation oncology, and uh, was member of the graduate faculty with the cancer biology program. So in short, um, Dr. Ensley, if there's something that could be done in medicine, he has, he has done it. So, uh, you know, really covering the, the, the breadth of, uh, of multiple disciplines. Um, he received a uh, medical degree from Wayne State University School of Medicine, uh, where he did his training as well. And um, uh, you know, not only taught within the medical departments, but also um, taught at Wayne County Community College, Madonna University, and Marygrove College. So we are very excited, very, uh, very grateful to have you with us today, Dr. Ensley. And without further ado, let me uh, turn the presentation over to you. Just a minute. Or take your time. A phone ringing behind me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harrison, um, and I appreciate, your, your, I appreciate your invitation to present the seminar. And uh, you, uh, I'll the rest of the audience, uh, in the middle of a post Thanksgiving family virus uh, infection, so I'm going to be a little hoarse. You may have to clear my throat from time, but it's uh, nothing. This is just a head and neck. Uh, right. It is good. It shows that your family is very loving and close because you can share not only <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner but all those viruses, which is which is we great. Are, we are our viruses. Um, Thank you a, a second to applaud you, best doctors, for the service you provide. Um, I've had on both ends uh, of, the, of the problem. Um, involved uh, with you since the early 1990s, and uh, I've been very proud of it. Uh, it's been a very pleasant association. Uh, I've always been a cancer patient for a month long. I've been a physician. I did a spinal cord sarcoma uh, last month in medical school in 1977. So in searing uh, 35 years, uh, I've had multiple opportunities to uh, seek out specialized medical uh, resources, information, and treatment. And I won't bore you with all the painful anecdotes, but believe me, there's been many instances where it's been extremely frustrating. Uh, so you can imagine uh, if it's someone like me who knows the ropes, so to speak, what it's like for uh, the average layman uh, trying to uh, walk through the, our medical system. So the search you provide, I think, is uh, is unique and extremely important for patients. And uh, again, I've been very happy and proud to be involved in it. And about my choice, uh, which you offered me to uh, present a topic uh, among choosing, uh, I'll tell you that the, the neck area is replete with uh, interesting tumors, perhaps older than anywhere in the body, uh, although I am prejudiced. Uh, but 
I'll give you two examples, uh, which kind of uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, I didn't choose either one of these, but it gives you an idea of what the spectrum is. Uh, this is a poor differentiated thyroid cancer, which you don't very often. Um, I've never done a consult for you for this tumor, and the reason is because these tumors are uniformly fatal, and by that I mean everyone dies, usually within a matter of a couple of months. And there's really no therapy that we have that made a difference at all. Um, and there's no other tumor that I know of in oncology that is just lethal. Um, spectrum, we have a tumor called cystic carcinoma. These are glandular tumors. They can occur anywhere in the body, but about 80% of them occur in the head and neck area. And they're fascinating tumors. Uh, they occur in women who are uh, 30 to 40 years old, uh, really present with a, a glandular mass uh, and even the major and minor salivary glands. And <clears throat> they can present with uh, metastatic disease um, or not. not. But they present with local regional disease. We treat them very aggressively with surgery and radiation. And uh, we all know, even if they don't present with metastatic disease, they will eventually, all these tumors, almost always, have or harbor metastatic tumors. But the interesting part is it can take years, sometimes even decades, for this metastatic disease to become apparent. Develop metastatic disease or present with metastatic disease, they can live for years and decades with the metastatic disease. I have patients with widespread lung and liver metastases followed and taken care for 20 years uh, with tumor, and uh, they function very well. So, a tumor in which, even though it's widely metastatic, almost from the time of diagnosis, patients live in almost a symbiotic relationship with it. Um, uh, than the other tumor that I've mentioned, the poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, which is uniformly fatal. So you an idea of the spectrum of tumors that we see in head and neck cancer. I heard one, um, uh, so far as the head and neck of unprimary. And it shows that this is a very rare tumor. Uh, uh, I've got 10 consults for you for this tumor in the last two years, and I've done two of them just in the last few months. Uh, it was very rare. Um, you see them quite often. Uh, so let me uh, present the one of the ones I want to present two cases. Uh, one came in recently that uh, actually added it to my presentation. First case, a very typical 61 year old man uh, who quit smoking uh, 20 years ago. Well, I have to tell you that quitting smoking well, it, it improved cardiorespiratory function may indeed significantly reduce your risk of developing um, an upper air digestive tract cancer if, if in, indeed you smoke for uh, 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 20 pack year or more. Uh, he has a daily alcohol consumption, which also contributes to this problem. He presented right like neck mass uh, with other associated symptoms. He had a, a CT of the head and neck, which showed two lesions, uh, one fairly good sized lesion at the level two, the other one uh, a sort of but definitely a logical lesion at, at the level five. Um, he went directly to an excision of neck mass to rule out a lymphoma. And I can tell you right now, this is the first mistake made in this case. Um, an elderly person with smoking history that presents with a neck mass has a head cancer until proven otherwise. They don't have lymphoma. As a teenager, you would do an excisional biopsy of a lymph node, but no gentleman this age. This pathology, not surprising, was famous cell cancer. Uh, and HPV positive, which as you know now is related to the pathophysiology, etiology of these tumors, particularly in the oral pharynx and oral cavity. Uh, he underwent PET CTs and pan endoscopies, and we'll talk about these later. Uh, and 
of all pertinent biopsies of all possible primary sites, and all these were negative, and they failed to identify a primary site. He then went to the concurrent chemo radiation therapy. He uh, was treated with the 5 issue platinum regimen and radiation, and given concurrent, developed this uh, regimen at State University in the 70s and early 80s, and we used it primarily for squamous cell carcinomas of the esophagus first. Um, this is used for head and neck cancer at the in Cleveland Clinic with David L. Stain in Europe with the killer regimen. Um, but it is extremely toxic. And as you can see from the remainder of this history, this gentleman failed to be able to complete more than one course of therapy, which is not, would not be unusual. So, in the of the unknown primary, and it's it difficult to define it. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, my account. So, these are that present at a remote site from uh, primary. Others are English usually because they present in tissues that cannot give rise to carnomas um, of the that we see because there are no epithelial tissue at the sites that could give rise to a malignancy. And it's often in lymph nodes which don't have epithelial or glandular tissue in them. Um, so you know that they don't arise from the site at which they present. We're left with the problem of trying to find the site. And in addition, being an unknown primary, even with all the new techniques that we have, um, we don't know uh, to find the primary site. Uh, and what's interesting, even at autopsy, uh, with current evaluation, of the, the, the regional tissues that drain to these areas, we still can't find the primary. Pathophysiology of this tumor, and this is somewhat of an oxymoron because I've just told you we don't know how it occurs. Um, so it's difficult to discuss with pathophysiology. And then this is a very difficult concept for one physician to describe to other physicians, to describe to a layman who happens to walk in the door with one of these things is, is almost impossible. But I mean, what we do know for sure, uh, somewhere in the region of the drainage of the lymph nodes, which is primarily what we see in head and neck cancer as a presenting site, um, there's a, a pre malignant to malignant transformation, so in the upper or digestive tract. Issues somewhere have made this uh, switch. Now, which is made, these cells acquire a variety of molecular genetic uh, epitopes and phenotypes, and it allows them to suppress their local and systemic immune uh, responses in the body, allow them to migrate to the tissue plane, enter the bloodstream, uh, travel to a remote site, leave the bloodstream, and plant at a distant site. Press again the local and systemic immune system uh, at metastatic site, stimulate angiogenesis so they can survive and get nutrition, and then replicate successively to the point where you can see them where there's actually billions of cells will be um, in masses. Now, these cells at their original site, their site of origin, uh, can perform any of these functions. Uh, and they do not propagate because we can't find them. So uh, it's almost contradictory, but indeed it is a reality, and we don't know why. Uh, they're tumors, they're not studied um, or in the laboratory. And it's fortunate because something's going on here, which I think is very important, uh, has very important implications for cancer research. Search. Fortunately, being a rare tumor, we don't pay much attention to it. <laughs> One of the most unknown primaries in the body are adenocarcinomas, about 80% of them, and they usually occur uh, out the head and neck area, although they can occur in the head and neck area. Um, they're almost uniformly fatal if they're adenocarcinomas. But there's unknown primaries primarily occur in the head area and have quite a different prognosis. 
lymphosis. And one of those is that the lymph nodes in the head and area are quite different than other lymph nodes in terms of being barriers for dissemination. If metastatic tumor and regional lymph nodes in breast cancer or bladder or prostate cancer uh, or melanoma, this almost always uh, indicates the presence of metastatic disease. In the head and neck area, the wall diarrhea lymph nodes and other lymph nodes in the head and neck area, uh, somehow, for some reason, we still don't understand, prevents, and in a large scientific case, even though there's regional lymph nodes, even extensive regional lymph nodes involvement, um, these things do not disseminate and, and don't enter the general circulation. Patients uh, present. is probably the most common, if not the most common, when they can just present in general. And about 2 or 4% of the time, <clears throat> the primary tumor cannot be identified. And in 1988, we reported 1,577 patients um, with a percent incidence of the primary disease. It's been looked at by a variety of other investigators in the United States and a large series with, uh, with the fever in Europe. And again, seeing about the same incidence, two to four percent of patients with cervical adenopathy will end up with a diagnosis of unknown primary. Interestingly, most of these patients, almost all of these patients, present with solitary lymph node. Uh, and by distinction to the patient that we just uh, described, who actually had two lymph nodes, with 15 percent of cases when it's schizolateral, and 10 of the cases when it's bilateral. Biology is almost always um, special carcinoma. And they tend in the uh, whole region of the lymph, uh, of the lymph node uh, in the neck area. The uh, patient we just presented had a level 5 lymph node, which is very unusual. It's usually in the area of level 2, uh, the dubigastric area, where three quarters of these lymph nodes occur. How does up? Um, your physical examination is paramount. Uh, it doesn't change uh, even in 2012. Although I can tell you from my recent uh, ventures out into the medical field, um, the physical exam, history and physical exam is becoming more difficult to find. Um, and it's very recent. Panoscopy, which we'll talk about uh, in a later uh, slide. Um, critical uh, for this workup and is a PET CT and when all of the above of these fail and uh, interrogate the pathology of the present neck node, you have to find the last one. And to reiterate, this is the one in which these patients should be worked up. Now, he is a procedure that's performed under general anesthesia, so it's not a benign procedure. It requires general anesthesia with its risks. But we evaluate all these mucosa, excuse me, and epithelium of the upper distal tract, which includes the nasal pharynx, pharynx, larynx, long esophagus, and biopsies of all pertinent areas. Um, we perform at least an ipsilateral tonsillectomy and often bilateral tonsillectomy. And in our multidisciplinary group, we have um, pushed this procedure since the late 70s and early 80s. It's been a matter of contention in the head and neck community up until recently. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Uzi, Orangology, Department at Ohio State University was my co chair of the head and neck committee at the Southwest Oncology Group for over 20 years. Uh, recently wrote um, a, uh, a series of this subject, uh, trying, um, making this uh, standard of his profession, otolaryngology, that uh, they be done in, in all patients. Uh, the long and esophagus are important to include in that they often can present cervical lymph nodes. And the superficial um, 
but that's to be considered. Families now are, are being routine because often we will find families uh, in these in these areas uh, with home, even in the presence of endoscopic evaluation, uh, direct physical examination under anesthesia, um, and uh, negative PET scans. And I'll show you a case like this uh, in a few minutes. This is a of an unknown primary with a large lymph node um, and an oropharyngeal primary that you can see in the um, The view for us in our uh, textbook, which is a revision for publication, uh, Al Lowe, who is one of our nation's best head and neck imaging experts, injuries that have been done up to the time that uh, was published and including more recent ones, there's been multiple years. About 20 to 50 percent of the time, when we fail to find the primary with examination and endoscopy, uh, we can it by adding a PET scan. So a PET scan is now a standard part of the workup uh, for patients with the head and neck cancer, uh, in which the primary is occult uh, under the, the usual uh, tests that we perform. We have one of these things, and we're pretty sure that we can't find a memory. <clears throat> we have to decide about how we're going to treat them. Um, we have another uh, dilemma, and that is there is no standard treatment for uh, cancers of unknown primary. Um, all that we have are retrospective data. All of that I'm going to show you is retrospective data, except for our study, which was a prospective trial. Single institutional studies, we were unable to get any kind of cooperative or even intergroup effort to look at tumors in the United States because they're just too rare. It would take us a decade to, to phase three trial, for example, even intergroup involved. They're automatically excluded from all clinical trials, they are unknown primaries. And in every instance, um, that what you initially decide you want to treat these patients, but there's controversy. Um, the therapy that should be done, whether it's an excision like the patient I just presented to you, uh, we're concerned about what we call dilated neck, which I'll discuss later, or hormone modified radical neck dissection, which is the standard uh, treatment uh, for lymph nodes in the neck. Um, whether what is or whether it should be used as the primary surgical technique is still um, under some agreement. Uh, therapy, um, waste therapy, what should be included, whether bilateral neck should be involved are all still contentious. Uh, whether combination therapy or single modality therapy should be used is still there's no Definitive clinical evidence, uh, which is the way to go. What's the sequence? Should you use surgery first and then radiation, or radiation first and then surgery? And chemotherapy be a part of your treatment regimen. The uh, average uh, physician, or laryngologist, even, or oncologist out in the community who gets presented as one of these patients, how um, even in the literature, you're not going to find any evidence of a standard um, that yeah, you can go back to the patient. Depicts one of the um, aspects of treating these tumors, which makes a decision about how to treat them so difficult. It was done um, at Mayo. Uh, all their patients with uh, unknown primaries over a 20 year period, there were 117 of them. In 24, uh, unknown primaries. And uh, they, or of these unknown primaries, 24 underwent uh, either a dissection or excision of their um, lymph node. Um, there was radiation therapy, no other treatment, just surgery. No attention at all to the primary. Now, relatively early tumors, 
let me figure out where N1, but the over the disease space survival in these patients was approximately two thirds. Now that we're addressing the primary at all, only addressing the regional metastasis, the lymph node, a significant percentage of these patients with unknown primaries throughout their lives without ever uh, have um, to deal with their primaries. So it is the baseline from which you're going to start in terms of trying to decide how to treat these patients. You can see what an enigma and what a problem it is. Uh, because you know that there are a certain percentage of these patients that need more than the next section. There's no way of knowing which one is which. issue of an excision versus a modified radical neck dissection and the concept of a violated neck. And I'm going to show you a case in a few minutes, which is going to raise this issue again. It had to treatment uh, considered a standard of treatment that all, all nodes should be um, removed with a modified radical neck dissection. Uh, excision biopsies are considered um, a variety of reasons, but primarily the major reason is, is to actually spread the tumor into the operative bed, um, particularly if it has uh, extra catheter extension, or for some reason you uh, uh, invite it to the, the capsule of the lymph node. And these tumors, once they spread, uh, in addition to that I just described, are almost impossible. Rid of. Even if you do an act dissection and, and you need to do radiation, um, this is the problem. However, here are two trials, um, one at Gill and, and one at MD Anderson, uh, where they looked at uh, excision and radiation therapy versus um, a form neck dissection. Um, these are not prospective trials. These people just back and looked at their patients over a period of time and put two groups, but it didn't make a significant difference in terms of overall survival, not whether you've been in vision and radiation or formal neck dissection and radiation. In spite of, of uh, considered the standard of treatment in his history today and the for a modified radical neck dissection, I can tell you that cell biopsies and head and neck cancer right level of a medical issue. Uh, how serious it is. Uh, um, if you had a recurrence in the neck and you had an excisional biopsy, you probably could go to court and win a case. It's that serious, but this is what the water is considerably in terms of what you should do in terms of the type of surgery that you propose. Why is indication of a primary so important? Possible in squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck of unknown primary. The reason is that most of these patients now today get surgery and radiation at least. Radiation ports that are used are the largest ports that are used in head and neck cancer. Now, the head is probably the most congested anatomically, functionally, and cosmetically in the body. And you may see diagram here that the radiation ports extend from the base of the skull. Include the oral pharynx, laryngeal pharynx, uh, include the uh, uh, spine, that's the sign, uh, include both necks uh, and uh, superclavicular area. So, this is a huge radial and a very, very functionally critical area. If you find a primary, you can reduce this uh, substantially. Um, it's critical if we can uh, to find the primary uh, in a patient who presents with an obvious gross disease. Now, you can see from the dates here that I received fairly recently, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but this is a 57 year old gentleman who smokes uh, and has had a long smoking history. My guess will be longer than eight. Years when people don't start smoking in their feet. Um, and he uses alcohol on a fairly regular basis, and he noticed a lump in his throat and a mass. 
and confirm an ultrasound. This is a substantially sized lymph node, hypoechogenic in origin. And uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. The MNA right away, as I told you earlier, that this is probably not the way you're going to approach this patient. Uh, the MNA showed a, a typical brain of cells and was considered to be non diagnostic. Now, there are this thing is in uh, the cell tissue in a lymph node, which is atypical looking um, This is a diagnosis of cancer, um, and this was not made. Uh, it should have been made uh, just on the basis of the FNA. A uh, gas scan done and showed a cystic right neck mass. Cystic masses in the neck are real problems for a lot of reasons, and we'll see why in, in a minute. Uh, so it was done, it was still non diagnostic. And a PET scan was done and it revealed two cervical lymph nodes and uh, no primary. At this point, Certainly, even before this, we would perform endoscopy, all the appropriate biopsies. Um, this was basically to surgery and time um, a an excision of the mass. A formal neck dissection was done. The very excision of leakage occurred on the mass, which was purulent. And each occurred into the uh, circle bed. Uh, more chocolate frozen section was done. Uh, so it was found to be squamous cell carcinoma. And immediately, uh, the surgical field was changed and the patient was prepared for a, uh, a modified radical neck dissection and formed bilateral tonies. Uh, uh, and uh, the right console was positive for squamous cell carcinoma. Now, the console that was clinically normal was normal. Uh, uh, a physical scan was normal on a CAT scan. It was normal on a PET scan, but it still harbored the primary. And he was required for a radiation therapy are substantially reduced now that we know where the primary is. Uh, so we got to where we belong. Hopefully the, the neck dissection that was done immediately prevented uh, the local re-spread of this tumor once this cystic mass ruptured. Uh, and the end of all of this, we finally ended up getting pan endoscopy performed, uh, which probably should have been done very early in this case. Now, therapy and the treatment of this tumor is also um, up in terms of what to do it and how to do it, what for to include. Uh, you know, solution the solution to radiation therapy is employed is all by the fact that most patients with uh, neck masses end up seeing a head and neck surgeon, an old neurologist, or a head and neck general surgeon. Surgeon. That's, uh, you can bet that most times the primary treatment is going to be surgery. So, any large series of unknown primaries that had an act treated with radiation therapy up front. Uh, it's always post operatively. Um, with cancer in general, that post operative radiation therapy uh, in patients with advanced uh, head and neck cancer, usually with the the N3 disease, improve local control. Um, we have a randomized phase three trial that's proving this, but the animal evidence from large radiation trials compared to surgical trials alone says that this probably is the case. Uh, this slide shows you several trials uh, from Anderson, from Princess Mary Hospital, Loyola, and a large uh, uh, trial is done in. Uh, and, uh, that looked at radiating both neck, just the neck that the tumor presented in. And what was obvious is that local control was then improved. Uh, bilateral necks were radiated. 
and it's true in the force type. The overall survival was not improved, and this is primarily uh, because the uh, some neck relapse, which in turn on a radiated neck, salvaged either with radiation uh, or surgery. So, more I would consider that the quote unquote standard radiation uh, for unknown primary would include both nodes of both necks. Um, and that's the neck in which the node presented. Adding therapy to the treatment of unknown primaries is, uh, highly, uh, has been highly experimental. Um, we look at our uh, results at Wayne State and published a paper in Cancer in 1989. And again, this is a retrospective review of all the patients we had over a 10 year period. And, uh, there was about 41 of them. Um, women had gotten came uh, uh, in some of them, and we took a look at them. The patients who'd gotten chemotherapy of a variety of different types had a large, very high complete response rate, 81 percent. That's pretty good for a solid tumor. And the patients who received no chemotherapy, the survival seemed to be improved. Uh, a trial was done in Chicago um, by a jurist. Uh, he had a variety of regimens that were used uh, to treat uh, patients with uh, this tumor. And in that the five year um, overall percent was uh, uh, good for an advanced um, epithelial carcinoma. So there was some suggestion um, from also such as this, even though they're anecdotal, even though they're single institutional and retrospective, that chemotherapy could have a role, at least in certain patients, uh, in the treatment of this tumor. And, and this was in the late 90s, um, I decided to design a clinical trial that was not that it had been reported before had been uniform. Uh, all over the place in, in, in almost these uh, institutional reports. And it would be good to see if we could treat these patients with a uniform uh, regimen. So we designed a protocol, a single institutional protocol, got it be approved, and began to enter patients uh, with unknown primary um, uh, state. Now, I can tell you that since we reported this trial in 2006, we've uh, had an additional 60 patients that have been entered onto this protocol. Uh, they have at least a three year follow up. Uh, and from those patients, is exactly, almost exactly the same thing as what I'm going to show you now. Uh, so, talking about, about not just 100 uh, patients uh, that have been treated with this regimen. I'm going to second to try to explain to you the, the rationale for how this protocol. This is a very aggressive protocol. We decided to go to the aggressive end of the spectrum and turn all the choices that I just showed you for radiation and chemotherapy. Well, from the first slide that I showed you, that some of these patients could be cured with surgery of the neck alone. Um, no, we are over treating a significant percentage of patients uh, with this aggressive protocol. We decide which ones need or do not need more than surgery, unfortunately. We did a call, um, it was run by my uh, colleague, Ed Wilson, at the Cleveland Clinic, who was part of my SWOG Head and Neck Committee. And there's an ECOG and SWOG in trial for patients who advance on the sector had that cancer, you treat them with surgery, they were too big. And there were three different regimens, but to make a long story short, the regimen was best. It was given concurrently with radiation therapy. Double survival of patients with unresectable head and neck cancer compared to the first standing, which had been radiation alone. We had an intergroup uh, post operative study in advanced patients with head and neck cancer. This was given adamantly, and radiation was compared to high dose platinum radiation. And again, our study in the United States, which is 
uh, we put before the Union Journal in 2004 and just updated just recently, um, a 10 year follow up. And the ORT studies on a year of both show a significant survival advantage, local control survival advantage in patients who receive post operative high dose platinum and radiation therapy. Uh, this regimen was developed at our institution and uh, the report that ASCO and ASPEC. So, in 1989. So, we have two regimens, we have a regimen in two trials, and this was also used for mutual uh, preservation and, and uh, other trials as well. Uh, it's superior to radiation alone, uh, and it's had that cancer of any kind for any reason. We decided lateral radiation therapy, including bonex and including port, including the nanotherapy. Um, so the ration uh, uh, scheme that I showed you with the reports uh, was the one we elected to use. And did this again was because there was no homogeneity in any previous retrospective that we could find. Next few slides are housekeeping slides uh, for this trial. Uh, we act carefully through our SEER data to make sure that we included all patients during this period who, who had been with the uh, unknown primary. Uh, they all were put on this trial. Uh, the period is 95 to 2002. Uh, they to, uh, uh, completed a modified radical neck dissection, uh, and which was concurrent chemo therapy that uh, involved cycles of high dose platinum at 100 milligrams per meter squared. Um, only carbon platinum when they couldn't tolerate platinum. The radiation course, as we described, they did include the nasal pharynx. It was a cell carcinoma, and this was an IRB uh, approved trial. All these pain in our multidisciplinary group, and I'm going to emphasize this repeatedly head and neck cancer, particularly advanced head and neck cancer, should not be treated outside a multidisciplinary setting. Um, that has yeast that's dedicated to the treatment of head and neck cancer, and that includes radiation therapists and oncologists and surgeons. It also includes uh, uh, the radiologists uh, reading head and neck cancer uh, and reading the head and neck area. Uh, in, in terms of the interpretation, is extremely difficult for the general radiologist. Um, it requires specialization. As the pathological review. Um, all of our uh, multidisciplinary components in our multidisciplinary group have a special interest in the dedication to, to the treatment of head and neck cancer, um, stainless cell cancers in general. Physical physicals performed on all these patients before we see them. Um, we have adequate uh, hematological, renal, and cardiac function. They were seen by uh, um, an oncologist under anesthesia, and they've had formal endoscopy and biopsies. Um, and the pan endoscopy includes uh, the uh, evaluation of the lungs and the esophagus for the reasons I've indicated earlier. The biopsies are performed. So, at the time of these patients in our multidisciplinary conference, this has been done, presented. Imaging studies have been done, they're presented by radiologists. That are specialized, the pathologies presented, um, and studies are done um, in all these patients. Once all of the above are negative. Now, actual treatment involves radiation therapy. It's given five fractions per week, 200 centigrade per week. All initial sites, uh, at least uh, 5,000 uh, centigrade. And the neck gets 6,400, uninvolved 5,400, even the superfluid areas included. Chemo, as I mentioned, is 100 milligrams per meter squared per cycle. This is high dose. We do this as an outpatient. Um, we have about this. Uh, we treat these patients inpatient with high dose platinum. Um, and uh, there's no in my mind that we. we um, avoid significant morbidity from this drug by doing this. 
Uh, the hospital isn't happy about it. Uh, we get the patients in and out within 24 hours, and we stay under our IRB, so uh, they make money. Uh, is, uh, you replace platinum if there is renal toxicity or some type of intolerance to this uh, drug, this platinum. And I'll show you the data in a minute. It's a statistician on this trial uh, file study with us and uh, involved in the ultimate analysis. We looked at local control, overall survival, distant metastases, and second priorities. Um, all estimates of time began from the day of the next dissection. Um, and all the uh, type of end analysis was done using the Kaplan Meyer method. And then I'll show you uh, for each of these. Um, uh, and the data were analyzed in a cutoff in January of 2004. Now, these are heuristics. They're typical for head cancer. The majority of them are or the average of age is in the 50s. Um, those are uh, down. Um, but wow, is the area that's highlighted in white. Um, very advanced group. Um, one of these patients were stage four. Um, stage four, which would be N2B or greater. So they had mono lymph nodes or bilateral lymph nodes or N3Cs. Um, so this is a group of primary with advanced disease. And how do you do in delivery? Therapy. This is a slide that looks at that. In 30 of the patients, uh, 30 of the patients, we were able to get three courses of, uh, of uh, cisplatin. One patient, only two. Sometimes we did have to substitute carboplatinum because of toxicity. In patient therapy, we were able to get in uh, plant therapy, all sites, interruption, and this is critical and the treatment of head and neck cancer, making the treatment of any cancer with radiation therapy. Um, one wants to avoid treatment interruptions um, if possible. And get around almost all toxicities from radiation therapy and get the patients through it. The toxicity profile, and as you see, um, all patient plasma platinum you know, that's just the way it is. Even in the hospital, even on uh, an audience, it still happens. Um, this is a serious problem, and all of this is persistent. As you can see here, chronic xerostomia in 40% of these patients. Um, lost haze, uh, lost salvation, um, with uh, leukemia, uh, a curve that, that significant. Some toxicity occurs, but it occurs transiently. If the hospital, if, if they're under uh, safe and, high, and mental uh, hydration, um, we can avoid most of the complications that are seen, at least in terms of kid toxicity, with platinum. If it's done in house, if you try this as an outpatient, these patients are going to end up with some um, rises in creatinine, which, in my opinion, is unacceptable. Well, let's see. What do we do with this? Um, I have patients we treated on two relapses. And they have large lymph nodes in three necks. Uh, they reach locally in the skin and the neck. And the one also recurred with mets simultaneously to the lungs. This occurred approximately for both patients. This is the Kaplan Meyer curve for local regional returns, which is pretty good. Again, I remind you that these are advanced stage for um, this disease. We had patients with four, four patients with distant metastases. Um, always a primary site for head and neck cancer. These patients all had advanced necks, um, and uh, the science is involved. It was a fairly unusual site. Again, these were relatively 
metastasis. Some occurred two, two and a half years after treatment. And again, yeah, from my curve, looking at uh, projected uh, distant recurrence uh, using this protocol. And again, pretty good. Second occurred in two years. I showed you one slide earlier suggested maybe extending radiation ports for that second primary that uh, they treated with unknown primary. Don't know whether this is the case or not. Uh, but uh, we um, uh, treat patients with large radiation ports. Uh, one uh, is uh, the tongue, 90 months from um, diagnosis. Now, should we consider five years of the cutoff? If it happens after five years, in terms of uh, an additional occurrence of squamous cell carcinoma in the head, that region is considered a second primary. So it's five years out. That doesn't count in this sense that not had neck cancer, it was a colon cancer. So we had one second primary that was a head neck cancer related. So I um four died only patients died. And one of these uh, was a patient that died of colon cancer, uh, which was the second primary. And major were patients that had developed metastatic uh, recurrence of their um, primary. So the overall for this patient group, uh, 80% is projected on Kaplan Meyer to be 90% the uh, period it's over five years, and that's our cutoff for cure for this tumor. Uh, I emphasize that the advanced stage. The advanced stage four tumors. This is a curve that you see with stage one and stage two head and neck cancer. Um, you get advanced head and neck cancer. So, and the use of regimen, which is toxic abdisection, results in high rates of global, regional, and distant control. Um, I and I think we I, I we did get some feedback. I think we fixed it. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll with my end. I got a phone in the house is right. <laughs> Um, our results compare favorably with other studies and actually were better than, than most other studies by probably 20%. One of is what you saw on the slides, and that is that um, they have long term toxicities. And again, you know that a significant percentage of these patients will be cured with real long or with surgery and radiation and did require uh, all three. Free. Uh, control randomized trial. It's not a mystery trial. There's no control on them. Um, I want to underscore this over and over and over again. Honestly, um, there are looks at this question, and there will not be one because we just do not have um, the power in the United States to do this kind of trial. They may pull this off in Europe with the ERTC, uh, but here I doubt they will ever do a randomized phase three trial for patients with unknown primaries. And what is is a is a prospective trial, and it's uniform. All patients are treated the same, and that is it's a unique in the head and neck cancer. This type of head and neck cancer. The final slide and. Uh, I used it for over 20 years in both my national head and head box. Uh, it had uh, two purposes. One is to re emphasize again the important multidisciplinary treatment of this tumor. 
Um, and my tumor should not, in any case, at least, should not be treated outside centers of head and neck cancer excellence. We're a dedicated multidisciplinary group with science uh, and work on the treatment of patients, uh, actually the patients and their families as a group, not individually, not sequentially. Um, all, all should be seen by all professionals, uh, the body imaging, the patients, the families, all at the same, same time. Uh, multidisciplinary care, doing it sequentially, sending patients from one office to another, uh, have to talk to each other by phone, uh, um, is multidisciplinary care. Now, that in our next conference over years, um, and into the various disciplines, uh, uh, opinions about what they were seeing and patients were presented. Uh, the Hindu proverb of the mind, uh, wise man, who asked uh, to identify an object um, by contact uh, with their hands. Each of them um, created this, a different part of this animal and were unable to describe what they saw. And it would be analogous to me uh, in terms of what I was hearing in our, in our head and neck conference. We had and it seemed like everybody was seeing uh, this head neck cancer uh, from a different uh, point of view and then not seeing the whole picture. And for you, this, this dwelled in my mind, and I finally ran across this cartoon. Uh, it was exactly as you see it. There, uh, in the early on the Hindu proverb, the, the labels were not there. I put the labels on, and usually I animate them but because... Uh, we just in a webinar setting, I thought it might be difficult. Um, but this cartoon, I immediately recognized all of my head and neck colleagues. Um, this gentleman on top, who's awful and wise and in control, has got to be the surgeon. It was, and then I saw that, I realized that it was our surgeon. The guy I mean, the tusk, has got to be our dental professionals and they're to. Uh, the treatment of our patients. We have a uh, general dentist, we have uh, a prosthodontist, we have maxillofacial surgeons, all involved in dental care, which is critical. And the front, who's providing some comfort for this animal, is our nursing profession. And without them, we, we couldn't take care of head and neck cancer patients. Um, we think members of this all the time, but it's very true uh, that uh, without uh, these patients, would would do well at all. The animal who was sitting underneath the elephant uh, being squashed, to me, probably that group of patients that uh, doesn't get adequate care or gets no care uh, with the neck cancers. In our area, in uh, that's about Troy, we have a population of indigent patients. And uh, this is common, unfortunately, is that our head and neck survival rates and American patients are, are what we see in white patients. That's uh, remarkable. Oh, Dr. Ensley, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt. This is this is David, and I, I, I mean, first off, remarkable, remarkable results in, in your trial. I have to apologize, because usually we, we like to have some um, uh, question and answer time, but coming on, unfortunately, we're coming up with, a, with our deadline, even even for the, the physical space where we're using right now. And um, and again, I mean, one, remarkable results with the study. Two, I'm a, a patient of my own at Mass General who uh, several months ago was diagnosed with um, square cell carcinoma of the tonsil. And to look back and see if he had an excisional biopsy before starting treatment, because so often we think tissue is the issue and get those biopsies. And the kind of indication in many cases to biopsy before modified radical neck this section is, 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 is very, very interesting. So, so what I'd like to invite folks to do, not only in the U.S. who are here and folks calling in, is if you have any questions for Dr. Um, Ensley, just email me and I can pass them along to Dr. Ensley. Sorry, I ran wrong. I didn't look at my watch. <laughs> oh, not at all. No, no, same here. No, no, same here. It's only because we have 
the folks outside the conference room. So, Dr. Ensley, once again, cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much for an outstanding presentation and also for some uh, very compelling evidence about extremely effective uh, treatment in advanced cancers. It's the kind of thing that, uh, that you know, really motivates us because we want to make sure that folks get that right treatment and, uh, and survive when many people think that uh, survival curves would be much worse. Thank I, more than one yeah. point I want to point out in terms of thanking you for allowing me to present this topic. I also just want to point out the position of the medical oncologist in this cartoon. Uh, yeah, that kind of at the end of everything, catching all the crap. <laughs> That's my last statement. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Dr. Ensley, once again, thank you so much, um, and uh, appreciate, uh, really appreciate you taking the time for this presentation. Have a great day. Take care. Take care, Bye. everyone. Yep. Thanks.